Why the move now to make you sole CEO and what's your primary objective? Thank you, Vani. Um, I think it, we signaled well to the market when we installed our new company through the merger of, of Legacy Janus and Henderson that our co-CEO structure was appropriate for the transition but was not probably a forever management structure. Uh, it was uh, an accommodation to the fact that we had special needs through a merger to bring the relationships and the history from both sides together into a successful integration. And I think we were clear that we said when we feel that we've got that integration well along, then it would be uh, to the board to make a new decision about what's the appropriate go-forward leadership structure. And, and they've done that. The good news is it happened a little faster than, than we might have expected, which is really a reflection of all the great work of people done on our team driving the integration faster than we might have hoped. Well, you do have your work cut out for you. JHG down about 24% in the year so far. And obviously, you know, lower fee, passive fund companies are doing a little bit better in this kind of environment. What's the plan for areas at Janice Henderson where outflows have been particularly strong? Well, we've been suffering a little bit in outflows in one of our traditional strengths. Our European equity uh, managers have had a, a difficult period of performance, which is against a really long-term record of excellence. And so uh, we're not really uh, head in the bucket over it, but it's, it's affecting our short-term flows and European equity funds, which is the largest single area of outflows we're facing. We have a, a broad and diverse company with excellent managers, but that diversity means at any given time you're going to be seeing some that are struggling more than others, and, that, and that's certainly true. But managing European equities is a, is a historic and great strength of this firm, and we're confident we'll come back around on it. But it's fair to say we're going through a, a, a disappointing period. Talking about disappointing periods and long-term records of, of excellence, I want to turn briefly, if we may, to Bill Gross. You said that you're sticking by him. You said that this is a short-term, some bad decision-making. But how long can you stomach the outflows from his particular fund? How long until it taints the rest of Janice Henderson? Well, look, I, you know, Bill manages, I think it last count, about $2.5 billion for us. We have about $370 billion overall, so it isn't a question of, of flows in his area tainting the overall picture. Um, it's, it's a smaller part of the overall picture from the, from the flow standpoint. Uh, but certainly we care about those clients and we care about his business. Bill's been one of the world's great investors for 40 years, and I think the sort of underperformance that he's seeing now is, is, is challenging and disappointing uh, to him more than any of us, but certainly to all of us, uh, uh, we're, we're not where we need to be. But if you look across his 40-year record, that's the anomalous period uh, and uh, I think, you know, in time he'll, he'll come back around. The Unconstrained Fund has, since October 2014, delivered negative total returns. Is he still your paint and manning? Is he still that strong quarterback for the rest of the market? Oh, sure. Bill's a, a terrific investor and, and, and a terrific, strong player. Uh, but as we've said, look, he's going through a really tough and disappointing time. And, uh, you know, he's, he's working incredibly hard to earn that back, but that won't happen overnight. He's, he's gone through a really difficult period, and it'll take some time to dig his way out. And, of course, you uh, brought him from PIMCO. You had a long track record together. Fifteen years you were at PIMCO, so you saw his fantastic uh, returns and his great years firsthand, as did we all. And these things go in waves. Now, as for waves, right now we're in a wave of sort of the popularity of passive funds. At what point do passive right. fund companies get too big that they lose that advantage and it's back to advantage active fund companies like yours? Yeah, it's a great question and please keep asking it. You know, and, and the question is what really is going to drive that pendulum swing? In terms of performance, we have an awful lot of our company that is outperforming passive net of fees. Uh, we have a lot of investment teams doing a terrific job of delivering great performance. Not all of them, to be sure, uh, but a great many. And so that isn't the only piece. I think the other piece of the puzzle is we have to get better at messaging. Passive has clearly won uh, the marketing battle to a great extent. And uh, we have to fight back a little bit more effectively. Um, I think the, that people have a sort of an unrealistic expectation of active and passive, 
And over time, we need, need to do a better job of educating them that we have a really good chance of outperforming uh, passive net of fees. Certainly at my company, the active uh, process that, that, that we operate across the, the broad spectrum of our assets uh, has generally, over long periods of time, outperformed. And, and we need to continue to do that. But we need to also get better at explaining that to clients and messaging that more broadly from an industry and brand point of view. Because it's clear as an industry, passive has, has been winning the marketing battle. Dick, you, you said on the earnings call that you have to deliver excellent risk-adjusted returns. How do you do that in a market that just keeps going higher? When do you see the end of this bull market for equities? And, and when do your managers see something else happening, some catalyst that gives you, you know, more to, to deal with, more to benefit from? Well, I think volatility has been higher this year than in previous years, and it's really relative volatility that creates the rich opportunity set for our active management to succeed. And so uh, I think the, the environment is improving and probably will continue to improve for active management, uh, outperforming passive, and so we look forward to that. Um, there isn't a shortcut in our business. You know, we have to be consistent. We have to be excellent. We have to do a great job at, at sharing our knowledge with our clients so that they feel like the, the relationship is valuable beyond just the investment returns. And there isn't a shortcut uh, to take. We've got to do that and do it every day. At the same time, we're really confident if we continue to do that well, we will demonstrate significant value over passive, and we will have a really important place uh, as a partner with our clients and their investments. So I know there's this sense somewhere in the world that passive is going to eat everything. I think that's theoretically impossible. It will swing as a pendulum does, and there'll be ebbs and flows to it. But so long as we do a great job as active managers, we're very confident that we can withstand the competitive pressures of passive and prove our value with our clients. It's interesting that you mentioned the potential, the outflows you're seeing from European equities. Dick, you've just come over to rebase yourself in London. London remains the headquarters throughout the Brexit transition that we currently see in the UK. What does that say about your intention on scaling in Europe and, and why London remains your home? Well, London is a really special city. It is the financial capital of the world, and we're really pleased to be headquartered here, and there's no plans to change that. Um, you know, I don't anticipate that Brexit is going to change that either. Uh, I think the most likely output, outcome of Brexit is we'll play brinksmanship here for a while, and then hopefully uh, cooler heads will prevail and we'll get uh, probably a, an elongated transition period and a more thoughtful and rational outcome to the Brexit process. That's certainly not guaranteed, and there are risks to that. Uh, and you see that risk expressed in the, in the uh, sterling exchange rate. Uh, but I think that's the much more likely case. And certainly I don't think we see anything on the horizon that will affect our commitment to London as the headquarters because London has this really amazing place in the financial uh, landscape uh, uh, of the world. And what about, therefore, your geographical focus and indeed your asset focus? Where do you see opportunities at the moment for Janice Henderson to scale? And is it, despite the outflows in equities in Europe, Europe a key area? Where, where should we be looking at you to expand? So we have five key markets that we're already uh, significant and strong in. We have the U.K., Europe, the U.S., Australia, and Japan. And so job number one is to continue to do a really good job in those five key markets. And that's, uh, we, we can't succeed unless we do that. We also have significant additional growth opportunities, primarily uh, in Asia x Japan and hopefully a little bit in, in Central America. But uh, we, we are in the marketplace now looking for a new head of our uh, Asia x Japan business. And uh, the team there, coupled with what will hopefully be a great new hire, uh, will help us develop our strategy and, and push that business along. And clearly that's a place that we'll be looking to expand and, and, and make more, more progress. One of your strategies, Dick, the quant strategy has been dragging a little bit as well. What do you see for that strategy in the nearer term? Uh, I think uh, um, we have a number of different quant strategies, and certainly not all of them are dragging, but I suspect you're referring to our mathematical uh, uh, quant strategy uh, in tech. Uh, run out of Princeton, New Jersey, and, and Palm Beach, Florida. They've had um, a very difficult second half of 2016. They've rebounded very strongly since that point, and then uh, most recently had a pretty tough June. Um, these things will come and go. If you extrapolate off very short-term returns, I think you can end up uh, sort of uh, developing all sorts of 
destructive habits and patterns. We don't focus on the short term too much. They have a multi-decade history of delivering returns uh, in, a, in a really strong risk-adjusted way for their clients. And we think what they do is very valuable. It's transparent. It's, it's cost-effective. And it's differentiated from what a lot of other folks manage in the marketplace. So I don't think there's anything significant to change there. I think patience and support of that team is what's required. Where are you seeing major flows, inflows, I should say? What strategies and what geographies are you excited about right now? Well, we've been doing well in uh, the U.S. advisor market, uh, in equities, in, in that's a really tough market. And we've been very pleased with the progress and, and momentum in that market. We've seen increased opportunities in some institutional markets around the world. We've seen increases in the U.S. institutional market and some parts of, of Europe and, and the Middle East. And so uh, we have a number of things that are, that are moving forward well and that we're excited about. And, of course, we're, we're not uh, happy with where our net flows are, but we are quite pleased that we're able to continue to have a 40 percent margin and we're able to continue to use the financial discipline uh, that we have to deliver a really strong balance sheet, strong free cash flow generation for our owners. So I think that's probably underappreciated right now in our stock price, and we're looking forward to seeing that come back. Well, and on that note, Dick, it feels like all of the major banks, not just in the U.S., but in Europe too, and in Asia, are trying to get the, the, the wealthy, right? The, the, the wealth management arms are really growing as volatility is down and, you know, trading units are suffering a little bit. How are you managing to make sure that the banks don't steal all of your, you know, your dollars and your inflows? Right. Well, you know, what we're trying to do is be a really good strategic partner for the banks and not just the banks, but the other sort of uh, folks who cover that last mile to the end customer. And so that's our business model and what we have to be great at. And one of the keys to that is the way we try and use knowledge shared. So what we try and do is take the amazing amount of knowledge that we have here internally and share it uh, effectively with those clients so that not only do we give them the right investment products and the right returns, uh, in the right risk framework, but we also give them a broader relationship that helps them be better at their own jobs. And we believe that that can position us well to succeed as a partner for them in the long term. Also, our merger, I think, was an important element to that. There's a scale effect to this. The banks and the big global distributors uh, can't afford to have too many partners in what they do. They've learned through the Madoff experience and others that they have to have really trustworthy partners who they know well, who they trust, who they've diligenced, because when there's a problem with somebody that they've brought into their network, that's a huge problem for them from their client perspective and regulatory perspective. So they're shrinking the number of partners that they do business with, and it's important for us to be in that smaller crowd. And so I think in that way it's really important to have the strength that the merger brought to us that better positions us to partner with these banks. Dick, I've got to ask you as a leader of a massive asset manager, an asset manager that has holdings in Tesla, I wanted to get your feel on what's been happening in terms of the way in which Elon Musk has been leading the business and the way in which we've been hearing about it potentially going private and what's been spoken about on the floors in which you work. Right. Well, I don't really understand the idea of, of what was suggested and the potential for them to go private. I mean, that's obviously an incredibly uh, large uh, valuation to take in and, and somehow take into the private market. I think there was also the suggestion that the current shareholders would stay. That's a combination uh, of financial engineering that I don't really understand what is being suggested. Um, so I can't really speak to, to that beyond the fact that I, like I think a great many others, are confused by what, uh, what's motivating that suggestion, why it was communicated in the way that it was communicated, and what it really means. Uh, I, I just can't interpret it. it. It doesn't make sense to me.